Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 31st, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. If you're having a hard time getting in, let me know. It seems like every time I click on the links, everything works perfectly, but I know that doesn't mean that it's working perfectly for everyone else. So please let me know on that. All right, what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hold off on your questions until we're through with the slides, if they don't relate to the slides. And that's just to keep my ADD from going, <laughs> from me having too much ADD. And your favorite stock picks. Wait until we get to the live charts for that. If you don't mind, that's for your benefit. So the questions or the individual stock picks don't get overlooked. And also, if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time, and that's also for your benefit. So this week's focus is going to be the bear market update. And I guess the question is, are we out of the woods? As you know with these shows, I tend to do like a deep dive into trading psychology. Then occasionally I'll discuss a trading method for a while, and that's a little bit more intense type of present. Those are more intense type of presentations. And then I'll back off after a week of that and just kind of get back to the charts. So that's kind of where we are now, kind of a back to the charts type of presentation. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from Greg Morris. All right, the question is, are we out of the woods when it comes to this potential bear market? Well, what's interesting is, and I didn't even think about this or notice this, I should say, this until this morning, was that we had a weekly bow tie. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through the mechanics of a bow tie, but basically we're just looking for three moving averages to cross over a very short period of time. There's plenty of other presentations out there on that. And then you're looking for one bar pullback after that occurs. And the other thing is, as long as the moving averages are an uptrend, proper order, meaning that the 10 is greater than the 20 exponential and the 20 exponential is greater than 30 exponential, and the 10 is simple, FYI. As long as they're in uptrend proper order, the conditions are considered bullish or the trend is considered bullish based on that indicator. And as long as the 10 is less than 20, less than 30, it's considered bearish. And as you probably know, if you've been coming to these presentations for a while, You'll know it's the relationship between these moving averages, especially when they cross over fairly quickly within three or four bars. Now, I'm using the word bars just to try to keep things simple. This is actually a weekly chart in here. Now, I've done quite a few presentations where, to a point where people said, hey, Dave, stop those presentations on the weekly bow ties. We get it. So they're out there, too. But what I've shown before is that when you have a weekly bow tie off of all-time highs, and a weekly bow tie off of multi-year lows and all-time lows for certain particular sectors. Obviously, we probably won't see an all-time low in the overall stock market. And if we do, then we've got bigger problems. But a 10-year low or a 15-year low, and I forget what it was in 2009. I think it was 13-year low, if memory serves. You get a bow tie off a low like that, then you've got a fairly significant bow tie. And the reason is the most amount of people have the wrong opinion about a market at new highs and new low, lows, and they might actually have the, uh, they're all on one side of the market. They might all be fully invested. And then if the market begins to crack from there, then they all tend to run to the door at the same time. So the point is that major bull and bear markets can usually be defined by one metric, at least by the weekly bow ties. Now I'm gonna show you in just one second, Usually when I plot a bow tie, or often when I plot a bow tie, I should say, I'll plot a 50-day simple moving average just to give you some reference. And in doing that, I noticed that a lot of times just a 50-day moving average would be all that you need to keep you on the right side of the market. And I'll show you a little system that uses that component. Anyway, the point I want to make today that I was just noticing this morning is we did get a bow tie back here the bow tie the actual bow tie signal meaning that we had to cross over a fairly short period of time in this case about three bars and again this is a weekly chart and this flipped the indicator from bullish to bearish 
And then what happens is we look for a one bar pullback, usually a higher low and a higher high. Now, some cases you just get a higher high, but that's a little bit beyond this presentation. But if you get a higher high and a higher low, in other words, a one bar pullback, then you have a setup. Now, this is programmed into Metastock and the latest version of Metastock. I forget which one it is has these already programmed in for you. So I had the programmer program a one bar pullback, which this would be right here for your actual sell signal. So this is actually, this little arrow was not put in there by hand. This is actually the software putting that in saying, okay, wait a minute, Dave, this market has turned from bullish to neutral to bearish. And then we actually have a sell signal here. But what was interesting this morning, believe it or not, I do have a point, is to my surprise that bow tie never did trigger when we made a higher low, 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 a higher low. Now by this time you have to wonder if the signal has is still worthwhile, it has all this uptrend negated. And yes, the market might still be bearish, but this bow tie, the way I see it, it's no longer in effect. Now, as I've said before, without talking out of both sides of my mouth, if we're just looking at the moving averages in and of themselves to define trend, and let me clean this chart up. So if we're just using the moving averages in and of themselves to define trend, then if you have one from all time highs, you should be concerned and you should be concerned unless until unless the market goes on to hit all time highs, unless you get a signal in between. Now, we do have a signal here, but this is not what I would call a major signal, even though it isn't a weekly chart. It's certainly something bullish, don't get me wrong, but it's not coming off of all-time lows or multi-year lows. Obviously, all-time lows, again, in the market, we'd have a lot bigger problems than with the trade. But it is a signal nonetheless, and it's something that's kind of interesting in here that has turned back up. So if you do... And I guess I might have confused this a little bit. If you did have a trigger off that bow tie, that signal would meet, remain in effect until and unless the market went on to make new highs. So that would be considered bearish or a bearish sign. Now, it doesn't mean that you want to necessarily sit around and wait for it to go back to all-time highs. You obviously would want to apply some money management. And that's going to make a little bit more sense when I explain the next little system that we're going to look at. So anyway, the point is that the market never did trigger this this weekly bow tie down. And again, I just thought that was kind of interesting. I thought that uh, for sure that we'd have a, a signal on that, or at least a trigger on that, I mean. Now let's take a look at the, oh, let me just show you real quick. So yeah, this would have been your, sorry about that. This would have been your entry right here. Now again, you might have decided to trail that stop I use the word stop. I mean, you might entry. Sometimes I use a stop entry on positions. So if a if I don't want to sit around and watch a market, but I do want in, I'll put in a stop entry order. So sometimes I make the mistake of using entry and stop interchangeably. But let's say that this was your entry stop or your entry. Everyone look at it. Well, the market again went higher and higher and higher. So you never did get an entry off of that bow tie. Now, I want to do an update on the TFM system. Now, before we do that, just real quick, I was just thinking about this last minute. I wanted to grab that slide, but I didn't have time. So let me just draw it in for you. The whole basis of this system is if a market is going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, then it's going to have to pass through B along the way. So if this is 10 and this is 15 and this is 20, and then this is beyond C, not beyond C, but beyond C, then it's going to have to pass through, again, it's going to have to pass through B on the way to C, and as long as it's, as it's near C, possibly it can go beyond C. And at the least, it'll have to be near C to get beyond C. Now, if it gets rejected near C and then rolls back over, then maybe it's going to go back through B and then all the way back to A on the downside. So this is a hard and concrete rule when it comes to technical analysis, this ABC thing. And I actually have a pattern in IPOs where you, believe it or not, can pretty much do that, buy at B. I'm actually kicking myself in the buttocks this morning watching one 
that has doubled over the past three or four days, and I decided not to take it. But that's another story altogether. So that's kind of my theory with this TFM 10% system is the overall stock market around 10% basis the S&P 500 is a pretty good number. If the market drops below 10% from its all-time highs, or in the case of this system, 50-week highs, then it has become questionable. If it's within 10% of its highs, like we are now, then maybe things are okay, or at least we don't have to worry too much, or as much, I should say, about conditions. So it's certainly a positive sign. Now, this will all make sense once we start looking at the charts on that. So let's, let me just show you the actual system, and then we'll go from there. Now, again, we're looking at a weekly chart, and this is a 50-week moving average and a indicator that shows where the market is from its 50-week moving highs. And if memory serves, look at this. If this is the S&P 500, this must be going back to the 20s, late 20s. But you can see that in the bull market that led into that big slide, we had a pretty good run. And then the market the whole time had upside Landry light. Uh, I've got... I have it called daylight on here. A couple of you emailed me and say said that uh, you gave me the term Landry Light. You did, but I, I guess I've given the wrong person credit or not enough people credit for that. So I thank you. Anyway, you can see that the market went more than 10% away from its 50-week high. And then the other thing that happened was it did close below its 50 simple moving average. And that's the only rules for the entire system on the sell side is that it must also close below its 50-week moving average after being 10% or more away from its 50-week high. Now, the reason I put that moving average in there was just to be a little bit of a whipsaw filter. As I've said in the past, you have to be really, really careful with whipsaw filters. You do need them because without them, you'll get whipsawed a lot. But if you try to put in too many, it's sort of creates a problem. It can create curve fitting, which of course the new curve, the curve in the future will not be the same as the curve in the past. It could also create so much lag that by the time you finally get in, by the time all your whips are filters say, okay, it's okay to get in, the trend is done. So you gotta be really, really careful with the whipsaw filter. And I would encourage you to really keep those whipsaw filters as simple as possible. And that's why I'm just using that 50-week moving average in this particular case. Now, one thing that's kind of fascinating now that I'm realizing this chart is, was probably the right before the Great Depression is, and I can't guarantee this. I mean, if, there, if I could guarantee some of these things, then you never see my fat ass again. But one thing that's sort of interesting so far, and so far be the key word in that sentence, is every time we've had a 10% sell-off, and we closed below the 50-week moving average, if you got out then, you would have avoided every bear market in history and every major, major sell-off in history. And if memory serves, I think Friday before the crash on Monday, it would have taken you out of the market. Now, obviously, there's no guarantees, but the point I'm making here is it pays to pay attention to these little simple market timing systems. And the other thing that often amazes me is how such simple, silly little things can work. And as I often talk, we all talk about, we all go through these holy grail hunts. And I've been on one for years and years and years, or I was on one for years and years and years until I realized that, hey, you know what? There is no holy grail. And my wife actually helped me a little bit in that because as I've told the story ad nauseum, I'd wake up really early and program trading systems. I still wake up early now, but my research has changed in the mornings. It's psychology research or maybe taking care of some business things or just checking the markets and see what's happening. But back then, I would program, program, program like a madman to see. It was almost like how many systems could I come up with and how can I find that holy grail? And then I'd always go home and tell my wife and she would suffer a fool gladly until one day she said, how many systems do you really need? And it's like, you know what? You just need one. Linda Rasky in years past prior, or I should say years after that, once said that all you need is one pattern to be successful. And I truly believe that too. So my research in more long story endless, my research in more recent years has been 
to figure out how can I simplify these things even further. And if we go back and look at what happened recently, we could see that we did have a cell signal in this TFM system not that long ago, back in, was it November? Yeah, it was back in November we had a cell signal. The market ticked up for a week or two, or a week I should say, started higher the following week and then began to implode a bit. Now, I didn't realize that we were this close to a signal until one of you guys and girls pointed it out in the Facebook group, and I'll be darned, so thank you for that. But a few weeks back, we did get a signal in the TFM 10% system for a buy. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here is that with any type of system, whether you're following it actually or not, or mechanically or not, remember that you don't want to sit around and wait for an opposing signal. It's not a stop and reverse system. There are some these stop and reverse systems, and in theory, they work great. You know, you, you short here, you buy here, you short here, you buy here. You just flip your position back and forth and watch your equity curve shoot higher. Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy and doesn't work that great if you're using a stop and reverse type of system. Now, the point I'm making here is, or trying to make, is that this market dropped after a bit of a blip up, it dropped nearly 11% from that signal. That's nothing to sneeze at. Now, I'll tell you this, as a trend follower on a daily chart, trading individual stocks, that's enough to take me out of every one of my longs and have me put on some shorts or two. Now, as I often preach, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So when you get a signal like this, at the least, you need to pull in your horns. As Greg Morris often says, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating, you can survive frustration. I made the mistake of being bearish in front of some of my friends, and I think I caused one or two of them to get out of the market, and of course, they're frustrated now that the market is going back higher after they pulled the plug. Well, that'll work until it don't meaning that holding on or buying hope will work until it don't. And I probably should not try to save people like my friends. If they're interested in what I'm doing, then they should pay attention to what I'm doing and learn about markets and how markets actually work and learn to live with that frustration. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but if we do begin to sell off, in here in earnest, I think what's going to happen is everyone who thinks they dodged a bullet back in December is going to possibly rush to the door at the same time. Uh, case in point, I was renting a truck a few weeks back to move, and I noticed the guy was watching CNBC, and I said, oh, I dabble in the markets a little bit. And he kind of rolled his eyes and, you know, filled up the paperwork or whatever, or pushed the paperwork over to me. <laughs> anyway, I, I try to listen and not talk too much, which is not easy for me, believe me. And he said, he goes, yeah, man, I'm glad I held on. And boy, I wish I'd have bought more in December. So I'm a bit of a man on the street kind of guy. I, I talk to a lot of people. When I'm out and about, it's it's kind of strange, I guess, if you think about it. But uh, I do like to talk with people. It's funny. A friend of mine once said, when I early in our uh, friendship, he said, "Yeah, I'm like you. I talk to cab drivers." And I'm like, "How do you know that I talk to cab drivers?" And he just kind of smiled. He knows that I'm a guy who talks to people. And I guess it's because I'm alone so much. When I see people, I go talk to them. But anyway, long story endless, I am a man on the street kind of guy, and that gives me a bit of a microcosm for what's really out there. And I think this friend of mine, and he hasn't really said it too much, but I'm pretty sure he's aggravated that he didn't just hold on. Well, when you start seeing these signals that in the past, not all the time, but sometimes have turned into major bear markets, I think it pays to pay attention. That's my whole point 
with this stuff. So we are actually back in bullish mode on this one particular system. I would feel a lot better about this market. And again, I'm not trading these things mechanically. I'm just kind of putting together my analysis and I'm keeping an eye on some of these things. But I'd feel a lot better about this market if we took out the recent highs. And there's a few things to worry about, which I'll show you in just one second. Now, sticking with the S&P, and we'll take a look at the NASDAQ, we'll get to the live charts. But sticking with the S&P, one thing I do find interesting is that we are now around 3% had changed from the all-time highs, depending on what time of day you check. 3 to 4% three to 4% away from all-time highs. So the S&P 500 has improved quite a bit, obviously. Now, as I said a second ago, there's always something to worry about. Let's take a look at the Rusty in here. Now, the Rusty's having a good day today, but the day ain't over yet. Well, we'll see. But notice that if you go back to the S&P, the S&P and the NASDAQ, for that matter, they didn't blow past it, but they did rally above these recent little peaks in here on the S&P and, again, the NASDAQ. And that's one thing when we get to those charts I want to point out is that I would like to see some acceleration against away from those prior peaks. Now, as I alluded to a minute ago, or I was saying, if you take a look at like a weekly S&P and especially in a Russell 2000, which we'll look at in the live charts, it does have a bit of this, it's a little bit more exaggerated than what I've drawn, this weekly retrace to it, thrust, pullback, and then the next would be possible leg down. Now, again, this possible leg down would happen if everyone began to run for the door at the same time. And one thing that's kind of interesting, in a bear market, the sentiment, or what causes a bear market, I should say, is when the sentiment changes really, really quick, when all of a sudden people decide that they want out of the market. Now, remember, as I preach, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, and very few of them have to do with the logic of the overall market. They get divorced or whatever, and they're forced out of positions, or they just panic for whatever reason. They don't follow a system. The list goes on and on and on. But rarely does it have to, anything to do with the underlying stock. Now, we did have a little sell-off. We did get uh, thwarted, I guess you'd say, at those prior little peaks. So that's a little concerning. We sold off a few days ago, or I guess it's yesterday. We did have a little bit of a sell-off in here, a couple days of sell-off. And then today we're having a little bit of a bounce back. Now, the Russell's a little bit more volatile than the S&P 500, so we'll just have to wait and see. But the Russell is not signaling an all-clear just yet. Not that the S&P and NASDAQ are, but they're both improving quite a bit as of late. Now, getting back to things to worry about, for financials, I like to look at the XLF. Oops. I like to look at the XLF. And as you can see, the XLF didn't even get to those prior little peaks before it began to sell off hard. Now, in a similar vein, the banks are kind of looking a little ugly like that. You can see they stalled short of a recent peak or a peak back in back from last year, I should say. And then they're having a pretty serious slide since. And even today, even though the market is doing OK, the S&P 500 yeah, it's still up nicely. Uh, the S&P 500 is still up nicely today. The banks are getting whacked pretty hard once again. Now, can the market rally without the banks and financials? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. <laughs> but you have to put all the pieces together. And again, there's always something to worry about. So ideally, I'd like to see that rusty break out to do at least multi-month highs. And I'd like to also see, obviously, the S&P accelerate away from the recent peaks. Same thing for the NASDAQ. And then in an ideal world, more and more of those sectors join along. Now, we're going to get to the live charts in just one second. A couple of things I want to get into just real quick. Last week, I talked a lot about trading psychology and talked about, you know, the prior weeks too, I talked about doing the right thing. And one of my reoccurring themes lately, which kind of dovetails in with all this, is, is now versus later. 
And if you go back a few weeks, I talked about acrasia. Acrasia means that you are giving in to the short-term temptation. And it's kind of interesting. I'm reading Dollars and Cents by Irely. I'm nearly done with that one. If you go to www.davelandry.com slash books dash two dash read, you can get a list of books I'd recommend you read. In this case, this particular one, it's kind of a behavioral science, behavioral finance light type of book, behavior economics, whatever you want to call it. And they do draw upon a lot of that that research from who's it, Tversky and Kennerman, Thinking Fast and Slow and that type of thing. But I I am enjoying it. The co author of it, which I forget his name, I think it's Dan something, tend to he's he tends to interject a little bit of humor and sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's corny, but I know it's hard to be funny, so I'll give him a little credit on that. But anyway one thing I read this morning, and it's kind of, again, these reoccurring themes, they, they go back to like the marshmallow test with the kids. They get, here's your one marshmallow, but if you wait 10 minutes, you'll get two marshmallows. And most people can't wait for that two marshmallow for the, two, for the second marshmallow. They just eat the first one. And that's a time inconsistency that, or that line of reasoning, I should say, goes along the line of time inconsistency. And and the time and consistency would be like, okay, I'll give you $500 today or $500 tomorrow. You'll take that $500 today. Most people will at least. And the alternative would be $500 a year from now or $505 a year in a day. Well, most people would wait that extra day. Well, if you do all the math, it's just one day $5, but people see it two different ways. And that's a lot of how behavioral science and economics and the psychology works is the way things are phrased, the way we see things. And that particular example is a time and consistency. And now it's tempting. It's like, what's the you know, procrastination pays off now? And that's a lot of the talk about acrasia goes into procrastination. So it's like, I'm, I'm backing off the beer now because I'm trying to lose a few pounds. I mean, that, does that sound familiar? <laughs> You know, but at the end of the day, especially after a long day, it's like I'm tempted to have a beer. But you have to think about your future self. Now, bringing that back to trading, where I'm going with all this is the siren call of day trading when you shouldn't, the siren call of intuition versus intuition, intuishing, as they said in Market Wizards, is very tempting. And you have to be really, really careful with that. Anyway, that's just some random thoughts I wanted to throw out there. And that's kind of my line of reasoning right now. And as I've said in prior presentations, the moving and all these unexpected expenses has gotten put in pressure on me to try to make things happen when I should just let things unfold. So I'm not immune to these type of behaviors. Getting back to the market real quick. The market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most. That's kind of paraphrasing Linda Rasky, which she's paraphrasing, which she was paraphrasing some floor guys or floor traders. But usually, like I just said, the market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most traders. So right now, what's got me a little nervous is the market is kind of signaling all clear to the buy and hope crowd, and that could get a little bit dangerous. And a lot of times you have to, Remove yourself from the situation and don't let that market fool you. And when I say market, in this particular case, it could be individual stocks, Forex, Bitcoin, whatever. Now, I just had some random thoughts in trading psychology, which last week and week before and then prior to that even quite a bit. One of my reoccurring themes is your trading will spill over into your life and your life will spill over into your trading. So just this morning, for instance, I woke up in a bad mood. I've got some some physical issues that, that may require surgery because I've spent so much time answering all these damn emails from these people who, uh, <laughs> who don't want to learn how to trade. And that's one of the reasons why I've created the learning management system. But that's got to be a little aggravated. Didn't sleep well because of pain in my arm from all this. And it's kind of a long story. But anyway, it's got me really thinking about some of these things. And so I just came in in a really bad mood this morning. Well, I found the market was going to open against me in some positions and all. And that just kind of pushed me further. Well, now everything sort of turned around. And now I'm feeling a little bit better 
about my positions, and now I'm feeling a little bit better about life. So, again, never forget that your trading will spill over into your life, and your life will spill over into your trading. And I did it as a little balancing act here because it really, it really, really, it really is. And I need to work on being a little bit more detached from the market. It's funny in these small accounts that I have where if I'm, I might be trading Bitcoin or I might be trading Forex or something where it's not my bread and butter, it's like I just put on the trades and I just kind of shrug my shoulders. So, eh, so what? And, and that's really how aware I need to get with all of my trading. And the reason I'm doing these confessions is none of us are immune to this trading psychology. And I think one thing that's got me aggravated lately is all these scumbags out there spending millions of dollars in marketing and making it look a lot easier than it really is. Now, it's not nearly as difficult as many try to make it, but it's not as easy as they claim. Anyway, that's just some random thoughts on that. Let me change gears here and get into the overall market. Any thoughts or comments on anything thus far? The pool is betting Tuesday for S&P Golden Cross. Is there a real pool on that? Larry McMillan used to bet on these binary, not binary option things. I guess he still does. There's a, oh, cool. Well, give me a link to that. Um, he's so funny uh, because he's an options guy. He's He understands arbitrage and things like this. And he'll take arbitrage on these, what do you call them? These bets where the percentage bets where if, if this is going to happen or that's going to happen. And, uh, it's just really interesting. And, and maybe I shouldn't look into that because if I do, I'll, I'll probably be betting too. But it's kind of interesting. Yeah, give me a link to that. So I'll check it out. It probably just ruined me there. All right, let's take a look at a couple things real quick. Let's take a look at NASDAQ because we really didn't focus too much on it. You know, it's kind of funny. It's like coming in today, I'm thinking, all right, now will be a good time to show that the market could be in a little bit of trouble. And what does the market do? Well, the market just starts going straight back up, which is fine with me. Okay, I'm mostly long right now, or 100% long, I guess. Um, of my All my positions are long positions, I should say. But NASDAQ looking a little better. Now, one of my complaints was, okay, so if you take a look at NASDAQ, we, one of the things I was going to talk about this morning was the fact that we really haven't accelerated past the prior little peaks in here. So here's a little peak, and then we've got, I guess you can call that a little peak, and then here's one here. And we just kind of drifted above it and really didn't accelerate it. But with today's action, it's looking a lot better. And this is why I take things on a day-by-day -day basis. But if we do manage to hang on to this, I think that, at least for now, things might just be okay. Now, let's do this. Let's go back to the P's just for one second. Now, again, S&P 500 was the same sort of action, just kind of drifting above the recent little peaks in here. And it's a little bit more obvious here. Here's a peak. Here's a peak. Here's a peak. Here's a peak, okay? So this 2,800 level thereabouts has been a pretty interesting inflection point, a reflection point, I should say. Inflection point? Inflection point. And that's that's it. I'm sticking to that. But you can see, at least on a net net basis, we really didn't get much past these little peaks in here. But with today's action, it's looking, obviously, a little bit better. Now, the reason I wanted to bring the peas up and then I also want to just take a quick look at the weekly one more time here, too. Before we do that, the reason I wanted to bring the P's up was that one thing you should keep an eye out for would be an opening gap reversal. Now, if you go in and watch the Q&A that I did last week and week before, I did some live walkthroughs on the opening gap reversal trades. And if you only take those trades at the inflection points, and these are day trades, you could actually do pretty good. It's when you try to make something happen in between when you get into a lot of trouble. But it's interesting. I went back and said, boy, I hope I took this one here, and I, and I did. And then I know I took this one here. Now, this one 
as I said in the Q&A, it was a little bit of a disappointment, but at the end of the day, I had more money in my account than at the beginning of the day, so I just need to stop bitching. And this is what I was looking for. I was looking for this trend day here, but it didn't happen on that opening gap reversal day. But the point I'm trying to make is make sure the market is overbought or very oversold, very overbought or very oversold. When you look to play these trend reversals, these opening gap reversals, I should say ogres, as we now call them, O-G-R-E. And do them at inflection points or if the market itself is set up. So again, go in, go in and watch the Q&A so I don't beat the dead horse too much on that. But as far as inflection points, I did play this one a few days ago here. And because it was a fairly significant gap, I think it was a little bit more than a half percent higher. And it was up until up at new highs for the year, multi-month highs and new highs for the calendar year 2019. So I figured it was worth a shot. I did not play this morning's because it was just an opening lap. And also it just wasn't, it was a little bit on too small. I think it was about a third of a percent lower. I just would like to see it take out like a prior low at least, and then be fairly significant. Also, I prefer if they're, Again, up here at brand new highs when they occur. So the most amount of people are on side of the market. Now, I'm spending a lot of time discussing something that's just a S and G type of trade. You're not going to get rich trading these, but sometimes you can pick up a few dollars in between, and they're kind of fun to trade. So the point I'm trying to make, or what I want to get to, or make sure I leave you with, is that if this market rallies nicely, if tomorrow you come in and we have a big gap higher, then it might be another opportunity for a, to play an opening gap reversal. But again, that's just a day trade. requires a lot of discipline, and day trading is not our bread and butter. But only take the best setups if you are going to trade those type of things. So anyway, S&P, at least right now, obviously improving. If we can close here at multi-month highs, new highs for the year, and let's take a measurement real quick. And if you guys want to start asking about individual stock picks, feel free to do so now. We are... Let's see if I can get the thing up. I don't know if you guys can see it or not, so let's put it over here. 2.84% away from all-time highs. So certainly improving quite a bit. Now let's just round out the market discussion, if I can get this thing to work. Again, the Russell looking kind of dubious until today, okay? Looked a little questionable. And I wouldn't rush out and... Let's not rush out and start kissing each other just yet. Let's take a look at a weekly here. Sometimes a weekly can give you a little bit better perspective of things. So, again, the Russell is still questionable in here. I sure would like to see us get past these prior little peaks. For now, it just looks like a big picture retrace, and it still could be in trouble. But as I preach, one day at a time. Energies are doing pretty good as of late, off a little today, but they're pushing higher in here, as you can see. I'd like to see them take out this prior little peak. Once that happens, they still have a little bit of overhead supply, but I am seeing a couple issues in here. We are along BE. I still think that's a good-looking stock, but so far the market doesn't seem to care what I think on that one. It was off to the races like on the first day, and then it came back in, and we're actually – I'm not going to tell you where, but actually not too far away from the stop on that one. But longer term, bigger picture, I still think it looks pretty good. But it hasn't taken off, obviously, just yet. Metals and mining have been improving as of late. They're a little wide and loose and all over the place. And then a the little concerned about the amount of overhead supply, a little more obvious here. So that's the only problem with the metals in the mining. Drugs have doing, been doing pretty good as of late, and they're not that far away from all-time highs. In fact, a few days ago, they were right at those all-time highs. So sector action's a little mixed. Like I said, financials could still be in a little trouble. Transports are kind of all over the place in here. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Bouncing back a little today, but certainly stalling well short of their prior peaks in here. So that's something. Put that in the worry column. The semiconductors have been doing really well as of late, 
And what's impressed me here is that they've climbed a wall of worry, and we're not too far away from all-time high. So overall, things are improving. Overall, things look good. But again, as usual, there's always something to worry about. All right. Let's take a look at some individual stock picks. T-E-U-T-E-U-M. Ah, this one looks super duper extended. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Let's zoom back in. I think it's interesting. It's just kind of super duper extended, about a 300% run. This would have to have quite a bit of a knockout. I think it's a little bit too dangerous, but I certainly do hear you on this one. And let's see what that run is. It's, uh, yeah, 300%. That's pretty close. Run. So I think it's just gone too far too fast. I think I'd pass on that one. GH. Now, GH is something that I'm kicking myself in the butt on. This was one. I think I recommended this one in the service. I personally did take the trade. That's why I remember it. And if memory serves, I got a swing trade out, and then I stopped out somewhere in here. And that's got me thinking, like, is there a way to keep a residual trade on as long as it doesn't do anything horribly wrong? And in a case like this, 100 shares would have been $6,000, just to, just 100 shares left in the portfolio. So something to think about. Haven't fully wrapped my head around that just yet. I've been doing this by accident in the cryptocurrencies when I have a, po a profitable cryptocurrency trade and I go to sell out. I'll sell out all but just a few crumbs and leave those crumbs in the particular cryptos. And that's been kind of fun. I don't know if that's going to be a longer-term viable strategy. So this is something I'm thinking about. And you'll probably see me talk about this a little bit more in future presentations. But I'm wondering if there's a way to keep the residuals. Uh, I have been watching this one. We had this on the Landry list a few weeks back right here. I just didn't think the pullback was deep enough because it took off so much. I actually wanted to see more of a knockout type of pullback or deeper pullback is what I'm trying to say. And to my regret, it took off without me. So it's looking kind of interesting. My only concern now is it's just so overbought, or I should say it's made such an incredible run in here let's take a look at the short term run yeah it ran 50 percent in like three or four days so i don't know i think it's become too crazy even for big dave but if you did take a trade here and again maybe i'm going to regret it but i think you really need a much deeper pullback maybe all the way to 80 or so before going after it but certainly you could do much worse by looking at a stock that's going against the trend obviously keg keep them coming Okay, this is obviously an energy stock, smaller cap, um, nice little run from lows, possible Phoenix strategy. The only thing, let's see, 900, this thing was probably reverse split, I'm guessing. Let's just take a look. Yeah, it looks like it's been reverse split quite a bit. Okay, so let's go back to the actual chart itself. Let's zoom in a little bit. Anybody know how to get rid of this big A here? When I changed computers a few months back, I now have this super big font in here. It's like the LE font, very big. i got to figure out how to get rid of that. Maybe on a pullback. This is a case where first thing I'm seeing is like, look at the, look at the HV on this particular one. Now, not that Big Dave doesn't trade wild and crazy stocks, but when I see an HV of 157, anything above 80, I begin getting a little nervous. Anything above 100, I start getting really nervous. This has got an HV of 157, so we know it's a crazy stock. It's had a pretty good run in here. This is another one of those 300% runs. So it would actually have to pull back fairly deeply for me to get excited about it. Now let's back the chart out a little bit if I can get this thing to work. And let's see what's happening. Oops, wrong way, Big Dave. Okay, so we back the chart way out. I don't see any real big problems way out. The biggest problem that I see is over the short term, like I just said, it's ran quite a bit too fast. So I think I'd pass on that one. It's just too, it's too crazy, even by my standards. Yeti. 
Yeah, I think it looks okay. In a case like this, I look for a deeper pullback. I did not play the initial breakout here. I didn't play anything yet. I didn't play the initial breakout because if I'm going to trade early in a IPO, in other words, a pioneer type of setup, I want the stock to have a little bit of excitement about it. I think a nice chest is kind of hard for me to wrap my head around as being exciting. And I think, as I said, back when we first started talking about Yeti, back before it crashed, it's like my brother and my, no, my niece's, my niece's husband, what would he be? He'd be my nephew-in-law. Anyway, my nephew-in-law, he's got an ice chest that's much cheaper and works much better, according to him. So, it just seems like something non-proprietary, and they're not splitting the atom. Now, with a stock that's not splitting the atom, like Lululemon, which is my nemesis because, oh, I'm sorry, Lululemon, which was my nemesis because I made fun of it, and it went up 40%, even though it was a fantastic setup, 40% over the next few days. But the Yeti, it's just, it didn't pull back enough in here for my taste, and then now it's going to have to pull back significantly for me to get excited about it. So this is one that I'm gonna pass on for now, but possibly if it does pull back further, I might be looking to go after it. We'll know when we see it, I guess. This is one I think I had on my lander list quite a bit, finally came off the list. It, it's bottomed out, it's kind of was a, a new issue a few year, years ago. It, uh, it's what I call the fly die, and then now the question mark over here is, is it gonna fly again? It had really too many days in the pullback. And by the way, you're probably thinking that, boy, Dave misses a lot of trades. Well, on all these trades, they didn't really fit the methodology. And that's normal, especially given the current market conditions. Right now, I'm not seeing a whole lot of setups. In fact, this is the fewest setups that, I've got, that I can remember for years. And sometimes that's the database talking to me saying, Dave, don't trade, even though I have a lot of reasons to to trade, I'm making air, air quotes in the air because I might have to pay for some surgeries now. I had to pay for this stupid move. I had to pay for the moving truck. You know, it's like <laughs> moving is a lot more expenses than I ever dreamed it would be. And now we're, we're still paying for expenses at our old house. So it, it all just kind of adds up. And again, that's that trading spilling into your life, life spilling into trading. So I am anxious to do some trades, but my database is saying, Dave, just tap the brakes a little bit here. I'm not seeing a whole lot. And a lot of times it's, it's because either the market's at new highs, you're not going to see a whole lot of pullbacks, or if the market's becoming a little choppy, you're not going to see a whole lot of pullbacks. And we've had a little bit of that, both of that, I should say, happened recently. And that's why it's perfectly normal not to see a whole lot of setups. So you just have to wrap your head around that and be willing to wait for your pitch. As I often say, you can't kiss all the women. So in this particular case, this thing pulled back too many days for my taste in a pioneer type of setup, or what would you call it? I'm sorry, a Phoenix type of strategy setup. So I decided to pass on that one. But I hear you. It certainly looks like it's bottomed out. Let's put the bow ties in. You can see that we did have a really beautiful bow tie back here. But now, again, too many days in the pullback. I think I would just pass on that one. Okay, any more? Got a quiet bunch today. Okay, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy, busy schedule. In any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLander.com. The question is, where can I find previous recordings? You can find them on YouTube, www.youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry. I think that's it. And if not, just search for YouTube, search for my channel on YouTube. And by the way, I probably did a poor job of this because I never ask anybody to. But please subscribe while you're there and you'll get notifications when I add in new YouTubes. A lot of the YouTube stuff is kind of like a fresh and unedited and unclean and uh, type of comment commentary. Unclean? That doesn't sound right. But anyway, it's sort of like unrefined. And then I'll take that and then and refine it even further, and that becomes part of like the educational system and all. So I would also encourage you, obviously, to join the members area, and it's a lot it's a lot cleaner, it's parsed, it's edited, 
and it's in a easy to digest format and there's also quizzes and things like that and plus the Q&A. And the Facebook group, by the way, Facebook group, you guys have been awesome in the Facebook group. If you are a member, please join the Facebook group and I'll prove you right away. But we've been having a lot of fun trading some of these little IPOs and some of these things that are slightly outside of the core methodology. So thank you guys and girls for that. Anyway, I think that's pretty much it. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and get now and then. And thanks again.